In this lecture, we're going to uh, continue our introduction to symmetry. Uh, we're going to cover two topics. One, we're going to talk about the uh, quantum uh, theory of a charged, of a free charged scalar, and we're also going to discuss discrete space-time symmetries. Okay, so um, let's start with the charged scalar. Uh, we're, our first approach is we're going to start from the idea of charged particles and work our way towards fields, and then we'll do it the other way around, just as we did with uncharged particles. So starting from the idea of particles, uh, we want to uh, describe our new particles not just by a form momentum, but also uh, a charge. And we're going to assume that our particles come in two charges, plus and minus Q. So these states are labeled by a form momentum, uh, which has, uh, is associated with a mass m. And these states also have a charge, uh, which will be either plus or minus q. Okay? And so uh, these are the one particle states, the state of one particle with either plus charge or minus charge. But of course, we want to be able to describe uh, uh, states with any number of positively and negatively charged particles. So the most general state, we'll write it like this. We'll have a set of momenta with uh, particles of plus charges and a set of momenta, Q, uh, of particles with minus charges. So this notation here is a little shorthand. Here, P just means a list of momenta P1 through Pn, and Q just means a list of momenta Q1 through Qm. So N and M don't have to be the same. We could have none of one, all of the other. We could have anything that we want. So this is any number of positively and negatively charged states. So on, this is our space of states. Uh, on this space of states, it's natural to define a charge operator, which just tells us the total charge of the states. So on one particle states, uh, the charge operator is just plus or minus Q times the state back again. Okay, so this is a charge operator, this is its eigenvalue, and when on the most general state like this, we want the charge operator just to add up the charges of all the particles in the state. So that means that uh, Q acting on this state here, P plus Q uh, minus, is just equal to, well there are N positive charges, M minus charges, so I get an N minus M, times Q, my unit of charge, times the state back again. Okay? All right. And what we're uh, eventually interested in, this is going to be a free theory, and so in a free theory not much is happening, but what we're interested in later when we add interactions is that we would like this charge to be conserved in all interactions. So uh, the no, there's no net charge created or destroyed. Okay? But for now, we're just learning the formalism for this free theory. Okay, okay. so uh, from what we've learned, whenever there's a symmetry, there should be a, uh, a, a conserved charge, and this conserved charge should be... Uh, uh, so so the, 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 the idea is, what we want to do now is we want to show that this charge actually generates a symmetry. Okay? So what we're going to do then is we're going to... This is now this, this, this charge operator has now been defined on the most general states, so we can just work out what it does. Okay? And uh, we're just going to go right to working in Heisenberg picture. Okay? So in Heisenberg picture, uh, the states are not going to transform, okay? but the operators in this theory are going to transform by uh, e to the i theta q operator e to the minus i theta q, okay, where q has been defined here, okay? And uh, theta is a continuous parameter, and so we can consider transformations where theta, the transformation parameter, is small, okay? And so this is O plus I theta q commutator with O plus order theta squared, okay? And this right here uh, can be thought of as the action of the generator Q on the operator O. The, the, uh, the, 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 the generator Q acts on O by conjugation, or sorry, commutation, by a commutation relation, essentially. Okay? 
Now, the way we want to define, we want to define this uh, precisely with factors correct and so on. So we'll write this as minus i theta q star o. So this star here means acting on o. Okay? And we have a minus i theta because that's how we conventionally define the generators uh, acting on things. Okay? So in other words, q star o is just another name for minus q commutator o. Okay? This is the action of q on o. Uh, in Heisenberg picture, it's operators that transform. This is the infinitesimal generator. Okay? Okay, so uh, that's how general operators transform. General operators can be made out of creation and annihilation operators, just as normal. But now we have to have two different kinds of creation and annihilation operators, one for plus states, plus charged states, and one for minus charged states. So we have a creation operator alpha dagger of P, and when that acts on the vacuum, it creates a plus charge state, right? And we have uh, another guy, beta, beta dagger, another creation operator, acting on the vacuum uh, gives you a negatively charged state. Okay, so we have two kinds of these guys. And the same kinds of logic that we did before will tell us, uh, uh, you know, what, what the, uh, we have the same kinds of uh, <coughs> actions on general states. So what we're going to do now is we'll define the most general state, which we wrote before, p plus q minus. Okay. What is this state going to be? Well, it's just going to be a bunch of alphas uh, act and a bunch of betas acting on the vacuum. Right. So we'll have we'll just write it like this. It's a product over all the p's, the p's living in here, of alpha dagger of p, and then there's a product of all the q's, all the elements of this guy right here, sorry, this should be, minus should be out here, uh, the product of all the Q's, beta dagger of Q, all acting on the vacuum state. Okay? All right? Okay, so this defines the creation and annihilation operators, different ones for plus and minus states, okay? And now we can work out again the commutation relations between these guys, okay? Now, one thing that's easy to see is that uh, it doesn't matter what order you act with the alphas, daggers, and the beta daggers. Because every alpha dagger just adds another guy here, every beta dagger adds another guy here, it doesn't matter which order you do that. So that tells us that, for example, uh, alpha dagger of P, uh, beta dagger of P uh, is equal to zero. Okay? Right? Okay? On the other hand, if you, uh, if you take alpha dagger of P, alpha of Q, okay, this is creating and destroying the same type of particle, a plus particle. And so all the things that we did before apply because plus particles are just a different kind of particle. And so this thing is going to be just as before, it's going to be P, uh, the, the, is going to be this overlap, P, Q, which is another name for the Lorentz invariant delta function between these four momenta on the mass shell, right? And this is, in turn, going to also be the same thing for beta. So, oh, I think I have the uh, daggers backwards. Yeah. So to get the sign right, for, the, for this to be a plus sign, this should be alpha, alpha dagger. And similarly here, beta of P, beta dagger of Q is also equal to that. So basically, these are the only non-zero commutation relations. The alpha dagger, the alphas commute with the, all the other alphas, the betas, commute with all the other betas, same with the daggers. These are the only non-zero commutators that we have. Okay? All right. And so we can, just as before, we can build any operator out of these creation and annihilation operators. So in particular, we can build the charge operator. Okay? So the charge operator is just going to be what? It's just going to be uh, Q, because it comes in units of Q, and then we want to write down the operator that, charge, that counts the number of plus particles minus the operator that counts the number of uh, minus particles. So we can, these right here, capital N plus and capital N minus, are just the number operators for plus charged particles and minus charged particles. And what is this? This is Q, and using our usual notation, this will be uh, alpha dagger P alpha of P minus beta dagger P beta 
p, right? So this operator here just counts the number of positive uh, plus charged particles. This counts the number of minus charged particles. Okay? So that's all perfectly fine. Okay? Okay. Um, now the next natural step is to ask, well, what are the observables, right? We've defined uh, the most general operators. We've defined this particular operator that we like, the charge operator. But now we want to know what are the observables. Those are the ingredients for building uh, the interacting theories, for example, right? And now we have some choices, okay? Because uh, we could, you know, we could make observables just out of the alphas, we could make them just out of the betas, okay? But it turns out that what we want to do is we want to have our observables have a definite charge. Just like it's convenient to work with states that have a definite charge, plus or minus, it's it's, it's, uh, it's useful to work with fields that have a definite charge. And so the way we're going to define our uh, field is we're going to define it as, uh, as usual as a Fourier transform with this Lorentz invariant uh, measure. And we have alpha of p, p to the minus i, p dot x. But now instead of adding the Hermitian conjugate of this, we're going to add beta dagger of p, e to the uh, plus i q dot x. Okay? All right? So this is just an ansatz, which is a fancy German word for guess. I'm just going to write this thing down. And now let's see what its properties are. So the first property you see is that it is not equal to its Hermitian conjugate. Okay? So you might say, well, just for that reason, it's a, it's a silly definition because, remember, I wanted my observables to be uh, Hermitian operators. Okay? However, I can, uh, this is still a useful building block for observables because I can write things like phi plus phi dagger. So if uh, phi plus phi dagger is Hermitian, or I could write things like i phi minus phi dagger. Okay? This would be anti-Hermitian, and the i makes it Hermitian. And so just by taking linear combinations of phi and phi dagger, I can get observables. Okay? So the fact that it's not Hermitian is not, uh, uh, is not so fundamental. Doesn't, but what is important for me, uh, what, I, what I'd like to have is that general Hermitian linear combinations like this, I would like those to be observables, right? So they're Hermitian, but the other crucial property they have to have is that they have to commute with each other at space-like uh, distances, right? And so that's the crucial property that we're going to have to check, okay? Um, but first, let me motivate this by trying to, to show that it actually does have a definite charge. So let's take Q acting on this field, phi of x. Okay? Well, I defined already what this is. What is this action? This action is minus the commutator of Q with the field. Okay? And so let's write out what that is. Okay? There's a minus sign here. And this thing right here was a little q dp. Okay, so now I'm going to write this as, an, uh, as a sum of o over an integral over p's, uh, alpha daggers and beta daggers. And I'm also going to write this as a, as a sum or a Fourier uh, transform. So I have a dp and a dq, the dp expressing this guy and the dq expressing this guy. And then what do I have? I have a term from here, which is alpha dagger p. Uh, alpha of p, okay, and that's commutated with the, the thing that this thing, the Fourier transform of this, which is um, alpha of q e to the minus i q dot x plus alpha dagger of q, no, beta, sorry, beta dagger of q e to the plus i q dot x, okay, so this is all uh, commutator, and that's actually just the first term, right? Because I also have a term where I have a, uh, uh, I have a minus beta dagger p beta p. So let me just write it there. So uh, my q, the Fourier transform gives me this term, and the phi, the Fourier transform gives me that term. Okay? So I have to try and uh, I have to work out this uh, this commutator here. Okay? Leave this here. Okay, so if we look at this commutator, look at this first term, alpha dagger alpha. Well, that's going to this term right here is going to give me a commutator here.
But the old, there's only one term here in this commutator because alpha dagger and alpha both commute with beta dagger. Okay? So for this term right here, the beta dagger doesn't contribute anything. Also, alpha contributes with alpha, sorry, commutes with alpha even for any different momenta. So the only thing from this first term where there's a piece that doesn't commute is this alpha dagger alpha piece right here. Okay? And so going up here, this is going to be equal to minus q, and I have my integral over dp, my integral over dq. And this first piece right here is going to give me uh, the commutator I get is an alpha dagger of p with an alpha of q. And then I have a leftover uh, alpha of p. And I also have this uh, e to the minus iq dot x here. OK? Now, uh, I have that's uh, the term from this. I also have a term from this. Here, the betas commute with this alpha, so this term doesn't matter. This beta dagger commutes with this beta dagger, so the only term that matters is this beta right here commuting with this beta dagger right here. And so I also have an overall minus sign, so I have a minus, and I have my leftover beta dagger uh, p here, and I have my commutator beta of p comma beta dagger of uh, q, and I also have this exponential, e to the plus iq dot x. Okay? All right? But now, these commutators, I know what they are. This commutator right here is just p, q. And this commutator right here, because the alpha dagger is to the left, it gives me a minus p, q. Okay? And these PQs just allow me to do the Q integral, okay? Oh, by the way, I just noticed that this Q and this Q are the same symbol. Sorry about that. This is the charge unit, and this is the four momentum. Sorry, they're different things. Uh, but now, anyway, the Q integral is about to go away. I have this minus Q here. I have a minus here. I have a minus here. I end up with a plus Q out front. I have a DP. And then what else do I have? I have left here, this term right here, I have left over an alpha of p, e to the i p dot x. And over here I have left a beta dagger of p, e to the i q dot x. And the q is really a p because of the delta function. Okay? So in other words, finally, at the end of the day, that is just this thing, this integral, is just phi of x. So what I've finally shown here is erasing this part over here, what I've finally shown is that this is just q times phi of x, okay, just by direct calculation. So this is the sense in which this field phi of x is actually, uh, uh, has a definite charge. q acting on it just gives me the unit of charge, little q, times phi, okay? Okay. So, now let's check that this field phi is, uh, commutes with itself at space-like separation. Okay? So we'll take, first of all, we'll take phi of x, phi of y, and here we're assuming that phi x and y are space-like separated. Okay? Well, if we think about this, we can see that this indeed vanishes without any calculation, simply because if we write out what this is, it's a linear combination of alpha and beta dagger. And this guy right here is a linear combination of alpha plus beta dagger. Okay? But alpha commutes with both alpha and beta dagger and so on. Everything commutes with everything here. So we just get zero okay, with no calculation necessary. But it's not that simple because, remember, the observables are actually made out of phi and phi dagger. So we also have to require that phi of x and phi dagger of y commute at space-like separation, right? If we're going to make observables out of these. And now it's non-trivial because this guy right here has an alpha plus beta dagger, but this guy right here has an alpha dagger plus beta. And now we have some non-zero commutators. Alpha doesn't commute with alpha dagger. Beta doesn't commute with beta dagger, OK? So, uh, we again have to write this as a double Fourier integral, okay? 
and uh, we have to have our commutator uh, alpha of p e to the minus i p dot x plus beta dagger of p e to the i p dot x. And we want to commute that with alpha of q e to the minus i q dot y plus beta dagger q e to the plus i q dot y. Okay, we want to work out that commutator. And the non-zero terms come with this, from this commuting with that, and this guy here commuting with that guy right there. Okay? And um, since we're now getting so good at these calculations right here, let's just immediately recognize that, um, whoops, sorry, oh, 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 nope, I didn't dagger this guy. So, sorry, this needs to be a dagger, and this needs to be a plus, and this is not a dagger, and this needs to be a minus. Yes. Okay? Yes, because I'm calculating phi, phi dagger. So here I had to dagger everything. Right. Okay, so this alpha can commutator with alpha dagger just is going to give me a delta function with p and q, a Lorentz invariant delta function. Okay? And that will allow me to do the q integral. And what I will have left is an integral over dp. And then I just have to collect the remaining factors. I'm going to have an e to the minus i p dot x, e to the plus i q dot x, and that just turns into e to the minus i p dot x minus y, okay, because of the delta function. Okay. Uh, similarly, over here, uh, I have to do this commutator, beta dagger beta. Now that they're in the wrong order, so to speak, so I'm going to get a, going to get a minus uh, delta function of p dot q, so I get a minus and that delta function allows me to do the q integral, and then I'm going to have left over these exponential factors, which are e to the plus i uh, p dot x minus y. Okay? All right. And this can be written as minus 2i dp times the sine of uh, p dot x minus y. Okay? And this is something that we had before, this is exactly what we got before when we were checking the, uh, the, whether these are observables, uh, whether a real scalar field uh, was an observable. And we had to calculate the uh, commutator uh, with itself at space-like separated points. We encountered exactly the same integral. Okay? And so but let me just remind you again, because it's actually quite simple, why does this vanish at space-like separation? Notice that everything is Lorentz invariant here, okay? So I can ch always choose a reference frame where the two fields are at the same time. If they're space-like separated, I can choose a time, a time surface, say t equals zero, where they're both at the same uh, time coordinate, okay? And then I can just compute phi of x, zero, phi of y, comma, zero. And then just plugging into this thing right here, I have a minus 2i d cubed p 2 pi cubed. I have, this is my uh, Lorentz invariant measure, dp here, written out in three-dimensional notation. Uh, and then I have this sign, and this sign now is just, this is the 4d dot product, but the times are set to zero, so this just gives me uh, a minus p dot x minus y. Okay. And if you look at this integral for just a little bit, you'll just see that this integral right here vanishes, okay, because this integrand is odd. It's odd under p goes to minus p, right? It's odd under p goes to minus p, and I'm integrating over all p. Integral of an odd function over all p is zero. So it's zero for a very simple reason, okay? Okay. So we have seen that this field, which is a linear combination of alpha and beta dagger, has a definite charge, and it, uh, observables made out of Hermitian linear combinations of it are uh, observables. Okay? All right. Let's see. What are we... So now let's reverse the process uh, and go from fields to particles. Uh, the basic claim is that this theory that we've just constructed, this theory of plus and minus charged uh, quantum particles, is the quantum version of the SO2 invariant theory that we constructed in the last lecture. 
So let's remember what that theory uh, looked like. It, was, it had an action, d4x, and then we had uh, two real scalar fields, we called phi1 and phi2, okay? And uh, they had the same mass. Okay, this was the theory. And because they have the same mass, this theory is invariant under an SO2 rotation. So we can define a phi1 prime and a phi2 prime, which are the SO2 transformed versions of these fields. And we have uh, an SO2 matrix, an orthog a 2 by 2 orthogonal matrix, uh, acting on phi1 and phi2. Okay? And so uh, because phi1 squared plus phi2 squared is an invariant, it's sort of the length of a two-dimensional vector, which is invariant under these rotations in this field space, uh, this action is actually uh, invariant. Uh, the fact that we chose the same coefficients here is, is just conventional. Right? Now, uh, in order to see the connection with what we did previously, it's useful to define a complex field, which is 1 over square root 2 phi 1 plus i phi 2. Okay, so that is a complex field. And uh, if we just go ahead and write the action in terms of this complex phi, we can, we can rewrite it. And uh, what we end up with is uh, an action that looks like this, d for x. We end up with a d mu phi dagger d mu phi. Okay, I've written out the kinetic term here, minus m squared phi dagger phi. Okay? So, for example, this term right here, phi dagger phi, we can see that this is just the length squared of this complex number, which is just uh, up to this factor of one half, which is sort of conventional here. Uh, this phi dagger phi is exactly this one half phi one squared plus phi two squared. And for this kinetic term, it's similar. These derivatives just sail right past this uh, this uh, everything else, and so this thing is equal to the sum of those uh, kinetic terms, okay? And one of the reasons for this complex notation is that instead of having a two by two matrix like this, now on this complex field phi, the action of this uh, transformation is actually just by uh, having a phase, okay? So e to the i theta acting on, e to the minus i theta acting on this, um, okay? All right? Now, if we here, if we want to, uh, uh, here, um, nowhere has the parameter little q, which is the unit of charge that we had in the quantum theory, that has not appeared here anywhere, okay? So, actually, we can include that here in the following way, okay? So, we can just uh, replace the transformation parameter q sorry, theta, the transformation parameter theta by q theta everywhere, okay? And so then what happens is now the transformation property goes like this, okay? Now you may think, well, there's not much meaning to, you're just, re this is just equivalent to rescaling theta. It's not quite that because uh, a, 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 a rotation all the way around is theta equals 2 pi, right? And so by choosing different values of q, you're actually uh, choosing different values of theta for which the transformation completes. Okay, but anyway, we'll go ahead and include these factors of q like this. Okay? Now, um, let's go ahead and uh, find the Noether current uh, in this complex language. Okay? We found it previously in the, uh, in the, uh, in the real language, in the language of phi 1 and phi 2, but you never, never can get enough practice uh, finding Noether current, so let's go ahead and and find the Noether current in the complex language, okay? So I'll leave this down here. This is our action written in the complex things. Here is our uh, transformation. And so what does the, trans the complex transformation look like? If we write this thing out, this will give us a phi minus iq theta times phi plus higher orders uh, in theta. And so uh, the, the linear piece, the delta theta is just the delta phi, the, the change in the complex field of linear order, is just given by this term, it's minus iq theta times phi itself, okay? So now let's find the linear change in the action. So here is the action right here. So we have a d4x, okay? 
And uh, let's, uh, there's a piece where the delta acts here, here, and on either of these terms. Let's take them one at a time. Starting from this guy here, that gives me a d mu phi dagger. And then this term right here gives me a d mu times a minus i q theta times phi. Okay? And then I've got to do this term. It gives me essentially, uh, well, it gives me plus a d mu. And now I have to put in this complex conjugate, so we get a plus i q uh, theta times phi dagger, and that is multiplied by d mu phi. Okay? And then I get this term right here, minus m squared phi dagger minus i q theta phi uh, plus, also times m squared, uh, plus i q theta phi dagger times phi. Okay, uh, that is it, okay? Now, remember that when I'm calculating the Noether current, I'm supposed to be taking theta replaced by a function of x, right? And it's only when theta is independent of x that this variation vanishes as a result of the symmetry. So let's just check that when theta is a constant, this variation does indeed vanish. Well, uh, let's look at this last term. Here it's actually very simple because this is just minus that, okay? And actually, that's true whether or not theta is a constant or not, simply because there are no derivatives acting on theta. So whether or not theta is a constant, these two terms always cancel each other. Now, if we look up here, we can see that if the derivative does not act on theta, then this derivative just acts on this, this derivative just acts on that, and then we see that these two terms are again identical, which again confirms that when theta is a constant, this variation vanishes, that's a symmetry, okay? So the only terms that we have left are the terms where this derivative acts on this theta and this derivative acts on this theta. Those are the only terms that are non-vanishing here, okay? So what we get then is d4x, and uh, I can, I'll just go ahead and pull out the term, the derivative of uh, theta. And then what do we have left inside? We have a minus i q, okay? And then what is this? This derivative acted on this. So I have a d mu phi dagger upstairs. And then I just have the phi left over here. Uh, over here, what do I get? I want the term where this thing acts on the theta. So I get plus i q, and I just have a phi dagger, d mu Okay? And <clears throat> this thing in here is by definition minus the Noether current, right? This minus sign is just some pesky convention. So it's essentially the Noether current. Okay? All right? I guess I should have written this as an upper uh, index here. Okay? And so let's snazz this thing up just a little bit here. This Noether current, J mu, is I Q uh, phi dagger uh, D mu left, right, phi. And I think, I guess it's actually a minus, okay? All right? And so remember what this two-sided derivative is. This thing just means uh, phi dagger D mu phi minus D mu phi dagger times phi, right? That's the two-sided derivative. Okay? All right, so it's an expression, it's just, uh, this is just redoing what we did before. When we did it, we did it before for real fields, now we're just doing it for complex fields. You see how it, how it, how it goes. Now, um, from this Noether current, we can define a conserved charge, okay? And the conserved charge is just Q is equal to um, okay, I think I have a minus sign somewhere, but I'm not going to worry about it. You can, you can, you can chase it down. <laughs> All right. All right. So the Q is just supposed to be uh, just the integral of J0, and that is d cubed x. I have my uh, minus IQ, and I think this is really supposed to be a plus IQ. I'm just going to change this. Assuming that I made a mistake in what I've just erased, this is what I have in my notes, okay? Uh, phi dagger, d mu, left, right, arrow, phi, okay?
right? No, sorry, D0, right? Because this is the time thing, okay? So now we have this thing called Q, which is defined in terms of the neutral current, right? We also previously, when we were talking about the quantum theory, we defined Q as the operator that just counts the number of positively negatively charged fields, right? It's the total charge. So now we have to see whether these two definitions, in fact, uh, agree with each other, okay? So we're going to start with this definition right here. This is the definition of the neutral current, and then we're going to plug in the expressions uh, for phi in terms of creation and annihilation operators, and we will see if they agree, okay? All right. All right. So I think I need some room here, so let me rewrite this up top here. So Q is I little q, uh, d cubed x, uh, phi, d, phi dagger d0 phi, my little left right arrow here, okay? So now let's uh, write this in terms of the uh, creation and annihilation operators. I need a Fourier transform for this guy, a Fourier transform for this guy, so I have a dp and a dq, and here's again this terrible notation, this is the charge, this is the momentum, sorry. Uh, and then what do we have here? We have, uh, we're going to take the complex conjugate here, so we start off with an alpha dagger of p e to the minus i p dot x plus a beta of p e, let's see, this guy was minus before he got daggered, so he's plus. This guy was plus before he got daggered, so he's minus i p dot x. That's uh, this the Fourier transform of this factor. And then we have this two-sided derivative, okay, acting on this and the next factor, which is just the Fourier transform here, that's alpha of q e to the minus i q dot x plus beta dagger of q e to the i q dot x. Okay? All right. So here's the one place where this uh, two-sided derivative notation actually uh, kind of helps keep things, uh, keep things nice. So if we take this two-sided derivative, what does it actually act on? Remember, this is a d by dx0 operator, so it just acts on these exponential factors, right? It just sails through everything else. So now, this two-sided derivative, I get a term from this, 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 and this, this. So I'm going to have four terms, right? And uh, so let's just write out what those terms are. So I have an iq d cubed x, and I have my dp and my dq. Okay? And so let's see, what do I get this term times that term? Well, the alpha dagger and the alpha just go along for the ride. So I have an alpha dagger of p, alpha of q. And now this d0 acting on this guy, sorry, let's do it, on, on this guy would give me a minus i times a q0, right? And then I get minus the derivative acting on this. This gives me as a plus i, so it gives me actually a plus p0. Okay? If you didn't follow that, this is the kind of thing that maybe you have to do it in your own uh, room. Okay? And then these exponentials still remain, and so I have an e to the i p minus q dot x. Okay? And now I'm just going to repeat this for the other three terms that I have. So for, let's say, this term times that term, I'm going to get a plus alpha dagger of p, beta dagger of q. Uh, and now my two-sided derivative is going to act on this. That's going to give me a plus i. This is going to give me a q0. This one would give me a plus p0, but it's minus because of the two-sided derivative. So I get this, and then I get my exponential e to the i. Uh, See, it's this term here, it's p plus q dot x, okay? And then I'm going to get uh, another term from this times that. That gives me beta of p alpha of q. Uh, and then this term here will give me a minus i. This will give me a q0. This one will give me a minus p0, I claim, e to the minus i p plus q dot x. And then finally, I get my fourth term, this term right here, plus 
beta of p, beta dagger of q, keeping the operators in the same order, right? These are beta, alphas and betas are operators. Now my two-sided derivative hitting on this gives me a plus i, a q0. This one would give me minus, but it's a minus the two-sided derivative, so I get plus p0 e to the uh, minus i p dot p minus q dot x. Okay? All right? Now, let's look at what we've got. This looks like a big mess, but it's, uh, it will shortly simplify a lot, because the point is, is that I can now do the d cubed x integral, okay? So the d cubed x integral will act on just these exponentials here, these last factors right here. And in all cases, it will give me a delta function of three momenta. So this will set uh, the vector p equal to vector q, this will set the vector p equal to minus vector q, keeping the track of carefully signed. This will set vector p equal to minus vector q. This will set vector p equal to vector q. So depending on which of these terms I'm talking about, q vector will always be plus or minus p vector by these delta functions. Okay? That means that q0 will always be equal to p0 because remember what these uh, what these uh, integrals are, these are integrals over the positive mass shell. So these are always integrals over four momenta with where the uh, uh, zero components are positive. Okay? So no matter which sign I get here, the, the, these guys are equal. But if these guys are equal, then I see that these two middle terms just completely drop out because of these factors of q0 minus p0. Okay? So these first terms completely drop out. Uh, these second terms right here uh, are, are non-zero, so I, let's, let's write those out. So I'm going to uh, erase here. Okay, and so now this is going to be equal to what? Well, I've done the, this integral, okay? That's given me a delta function which has done this integral right here. So what do I have left? I just have... Uh, this integral left, which is a d cubed p over 2 pi cubed, writing it out. Let me not forget the little, uh, the i times q out front. Uh, this integral right here is d cubed p over 2 pi cubed. I have an e of p. When I crossed out this integral right here, I have to make sure that I don't forget there's a stray factor of 2 e q that's left over, but that's the same as 2 e p. There's also a 2 pi cubed here, but that was actually canceled by a 2 pi cubed from the integral over x, okay? And then what do I have left? I have left everything that's in the brackets that survives. So I have a minus i from here, uh, and then this thing right here gives me a 2 e of p, okay, from these guys right here. Uh, and then I have my operators, alpha dagger p alpha of uh, P, because remember, this is a term where, where p vector equals q vector, and so the whole four vectors are actually equal. So this is legitimate for me to plug in. Then I jump down to this term right here. And what do I have? I have a plus i, okay? And then I have my beta of p, beta dagger of p. And again, this is a term where the three momenta are equal, therefore the four momenta are equal. I have my plus i here, and then I have I wrote it on the other side this time, my 2e of p, which comes from this term right here. Okay? So, putting it all together, we see that, okay, this 2e of p's here cancel one of these guys over here, okay? And uh, what is this? Uh, this thing right here, I guess I could have just kept this as dp, the, the Lorentz invariant thing. I probably should have, but I didn't. And then I have this minus i, which combines with this i, so I just get a q, a plus q, and then I have my dp, I'll write it that way now, and then I simply, all I have left is just alpha dagger p, alpha of p, minus, because these guys have the opposite sign, beta of p, beta dagger of p. Okay? Phew. Okay, so I calculated what q is from the using the Nerder definition of Q, and plugging in the alphas and the alpha daggers, okay, and I got this. 
is that equal to what I got before when I was just defining it to be the thing that counts the number of plus minus the number of minus charges? And the answer is, it's so close, but it's not quite. <laughs> What's wrong is just the order of this guy right here. If you look back on what we said for uh, Q, it had the beta dagger and the beta in the other order. And beta and beta dagger don't actually commute. What is this? This is equal to the thing written in the other order, which would give me what I want, plus this commutator, the commutator of beta of p, uh, beta dagger of p. And what is this? That is p, p, right? It's the same p. This is the delta function of p minus p. It's an infinite constant, OK? So it seems that these, these two things differ by an infinite constant, all right? Now, at this point, you should be wondering, if you didn't already wonder before, who told me what order I was supposed to write these operators? When I wrote the Noether current, I was deriving it in a classical theory, and I didn't have to worry about which fields were on which side of which things. Fields are just real, they, they were complex fields, but they were C numbers. They just commuted with each other. And I derived an intercurrent just happily commuting everything around. But then when I plug it in, when I plug into this operator expression, suddenly it matters which order operators come in, right? And so the, the, the answer to the question of who told you what order to put these operators in is nobody. There's actually an ambiguity in how you order the operators, okay? And so what, we, uh, so what we really want to do is we want to construct the quantum theory. The quantum theory is more fundamental than the classical theory. The fact that we cannot uniquely derive the quantum theory from the classical theory does not bother us, right? But what we can see is that the, the way to make them agree is to define, okay, the uh, Q in hindsight to be d cubed x j0 Okay, this is what we would have defined uh, with this, with, uh, uh, this is what we wrote down before, this is the Noether prescription, but now we've seen that this is actually ambiguous because we don't know whether to write alphas on the right, alpha daggers on the right, whatever, but what we're gonna, we're gonna fix that ambiguity by requiring this to be normal ordered, right? So normal ordering is something we've discussed before in the problems. What this means is, is that alpha daggers to the left of alphas, beta daggers to the left of betas. So basically, you put all the dagger guys to the left, all the non-dagger guys to the right. Okay, and the basic property, and, and and this sounds like this is just some crazy prescription, but it it actually works, and it actually has nice properties, some of which you've already seen in the in the homework. But the the most basic property of a normal ordered operator is that if we look at its vacuum expectation value that vacuum expectation on you is always zero. And the reason is simply is that all the annihilation operators are going on the right where they can hit this guy. All the annihilation operators are on the left where they hit this guy. So the, the, the vacuum expectation value is always zero. General non-normal ordered operators have infinite vacuum expectation values. So in some sense, this is like, this, at least part of what normal ordering is doing is it's subtracting off an infinite constant C number value from the operator. Uh, and so for bilinears like this, that's exactly what you're doing because you can see that the difference between what we want and what we got was an infinite C number, okay? But more generally, this is the prescription, okay? All right. Okay, now we're going to switch gears a little bit and we're going to talk about discrete space-time symmetries. Okay. So remember that when we talked about Lorentz transformations, we first uh, derived, uh, we wrote their defining property as this, right? That they, in a sense, they leave the metric eta mu nu invariant in the sense that they obey this equation. But then we saw that this right here is actually more general. This defines transformations that are more general than just boosts and rotations. Boosts and rotations are the only thing that we actually have experimental evidence for. 
So uh, we want to for sure keep boosts and rotations, uh, sorry, we have direct, they're not the only things we have experimental evidence for, but all of the classic tests of special relativity, like muon decay, that, that show us that time dilation exists, and certainly the fact that you know, nature seems to be rotationally invariant, all those things are, 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 are only testing rotations and boosts. So we don't want to assume any more than that to begin with, at least. Okay? And so, uh, so the basic, uh, the, the way that you see that there are these additional transformations is that uh, there are, uh, there is a, there's a component of these transformations that are connected to the identity where the determinant of this 4 by 4 matrix is plus 1, okay? The determinant is always plus or minus 1. These, this relation can be, okay, so let me just back up. This relation here can be shown to imply that the determinant of this matrix is either plus or minus 1, just by taking the determinant of both sides. And by taking the 0, 0 component of both sides, you can show that lambda 0, 0 is either bigger than or equal to plus 1, or it's less than or equal to minus 1. Okay? And the reason that this, these facts are important is because the, the boosts and rotations have the property that the determinant is plus 1 and the delta 0, 0 is uh, bigger than plus 1. And those are the only Lorentz transformations that can be continuously connected to the identity transformation. Okay? So we have the boosts and rotations which are, can be continu continuously connected to the identity and they satisfy these relationships right here. Okay? But then we can get more general things uh, that, that violate these conditions by apl applying two special uh, Lorentz transformations. One of them is uh, PMU nu parity. And what this is, is this is a diagonal matrix which is 1 for the time component and minus 1 for the space components. Right? Okay? And uh, another one we can apply is time reversal. I'll call that T mu nu. Okay? And that is the opposite thing, where we flip the sign of the time and keep the space components the same. Okay? And these, you can easily check, satisfy this equation right here. They are indeed, they do indeed leave the metric invariant. Okay? But they change these conditions right here. So, for example, if I do a parity transformation, the parity changes the determinant here, but it doesn't change the sign of delta zero, zero. And so what I get are transformations where the determinant is minus one. If I do a parity transformation on one, one of these guys, and then I get lambda zero, zero is bigger than or equal to plus one. Okay? On the other hand, if I do a time reversal transformation, a time reversal transformation changes both of these guys. So the determinant of lambda is minus 1, okay, and lambda 0, 0 is less than or equal to minus 1. So I can get another set of, and then I can do rotations and boosts here, right? Just like here, I can do a parity transformation, then I can do rotations and boosts, and I can get more general lambdas that obey these conditions. And then I can, if I do a, a time reversal transformation, then I can do a parity transformation, okay, and I can get things where now the determinant is. Uh, is, is changed sign again, so the determinant is plus one, and this parity transformation didn't change the, sorry, this is less than or equal to minus one. Okay, when I could have got there by doing a parity transformation and then a time reversal transformation, it doesn't matter which order you do these, so this thing right here is a PT transformation, right? It doesn't matter if it's TP or PT, end up with the same thing, okay? So, in general, these things, which I can think of as generalized Lorentz transformations, are rotations and boosts, the component that's connected to the identity, plus I can maybe do parity and time reversal transformations. Okay? So it's an interesting question whether or not a theory is invariant under these. It's an experimental question. It may or may not be. Okay? So let's investigate how these transformations, P and T, act on uh, the quantum fields that we've defined. Okay, so we'll start with parity. So let's say that we have uh, phi is a, a real uh, quantum field, right? A real scalar field. Okay, 
It's a quantum field. Okay, it's a free field, a real free scalar field, and we want to know how parity acts on it. Okay, well, uh, clearly what we want is we we're using the Heisenberg picture, right? We would have p inverse p, sorry, p inverse operator p. That's what uh, what phi transforms to. So let me just say that. Sorry, phi of x is supposed to transform to a new phi of x, right? And uh, what is that going to be? This is going to be p inverse phi of x uh, p, okay? And uh, let me write this as phi of x and t p, write it out explicitly. And the, uh, the obvious guess is, well, what does this do? What does p do to this field? It reverses x and doesn't reverse t, okay? So what we would do is we would want to define this as phi of minus x comma t. Okay? All right? So why did I put a question mark here? Okay? The reason I put a question mark here is that, that uh, I can define P to act in this way. Now I've defined P, and now I don't have any choice as to what P is. Okay? But now uh, it's not clear whether P is a, uh, is, is a unitary matrix. Okay? All right? So for right now, we've defined P, and our strategy is going to be now to work out some of its properties. Okay? So one property that this transformation has, which is very clear, is that P squared equals 1. In other words, if you do P and do P again, you get back the original thing. Right? That's clear. You do it once, you reverse the sign of X. You do it twice, you get back to where you started. So that's good. Okay? Um, if we define we want to define parity to act in this way on the fields, how does it act on general operators? Well, generator, general operators can be written in terms of the creation and annihilation operators, and so it's clear that what we want is P inverse alpha of P. Uh, P is going to be alpha of the tilde for momenta, where what we mean by this is we just change the sign of the spatial component. So if the four momentum p mu is p0 uh, p vector, then the tilde four momentum is the one that we get by just changing the sign of the spatial components. Okay? Now, by the way, one thing I should uh, emphasize here is that this is not a rotation, right? You might say, oh, well, gee, I, I know how to take a vector to minus p. I just do a 180 degree rotation, right? But the point is, is that 180 degree rotation will not take every other vector to minus itself, right? Uh, so the only, uh, the only way to take every vector to minus itself is, uh, it, for example, you know, if I do this 180 degree rotation, there's the axis of rotation, it doesn't change that at all, right? So the only way to take P minus itself, it, it, this is a transformation which is not a rotation, it's a, it's a very different thing, right? Okay? So anyway, uh, this is how we want to act on the alphas. And once I tell you how the, the transformation acts on the alphas, I can build any operator out of the alphas and the alpha daggers, and so I know how it transforms under all, transforms every possible operator. Okay? So uh, P is completely defined, but now the important question is whether it is unitary. Okay? And this isn't just some technical thing, oh gee, I like unitary operators. The point is, is that a, 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 a transformation like this is a symmetry only if it is unitary. So the question of whether it's unitary is really the question of whether it is a symmetry. Okay? So this is an absolutely crucial question. Okay, so let's see if it is. So uh, the way I'm going to... Uh, the way I'm going to check this is I'm going to just evaluate its matrix elements between an arbitrary state. So I'm going to take an arbitrary state, Q1 through Qm, P, P1 through Pn, okay? So remember, I'm talking about a real free scalar field here, right? Okay? And uh, what is this? Okay, well, I have Q1 through Qm, and then I can write this as alpha dagger P1, through alpha dagger Pn acting on the vacuum, right? Okay. But now I can uh, write this in terms of the Ps acting on these alphas. So I can write, here's my Q1 through Qm. I can write this as P alpha dagger P1 P inverse. 
And then I have to write a P here on the next guy and so on to the next guy. So I end up with P alpha dagger of P n, P inverse. And then on the last factor, I have a P acting on 0. So I've just inserted P inverse P zeros everywhere. Okay? And now this thing right here is just alpha dagger of P1 tilde. Okay? If you've been paying very careful attention, you'll see that I, before I had P inverse and here and P here, but it really doesn't matter. Remember that P squared is uh, 1, and that tells me that P inverse is the same as P. So P inverse P is the same thing. So this is true. So each of these factors right here gives me an alpha dagger of a tilde P. Okay? And this last factor here, P acting on the vacuum, well, the vacuum is invariant under P, so this is just the vacuum back again. Okay? So if I put all this together, all that I get is I get Q1, Q1 through Qm, and then I get a bunch of tilde things here, P1 tilde Pn. Okay? And even if I hadn't gone through this, right, I went through this sort of step by step, uh, this result should be essentially obvious. It says that the effect of parity is simply to reverse the three momenta of all of the states on which it acts. I mean, it's satisfying that that's what came out. What else, what else could it be? Okay? Okay. Um, and, and what is this? This is just going to be a product of, uh, of delta functions, where this is equal to that, this, you know, the second guy is equal to the second guy, plus all permutations, right? That's what this is. Okay? Good. So now, let's, uh, we, we evaluated this for P. Now let's evaluate it for P dagger. Okay? We've evaluated the general matrix element of P. Now let's do P dagger. And we do that by flipping these guys, P1 through Pn. And then we have P, Q1 through Qm star. Right? So this is just a definition of dagger. This is what dagger means. Okay? But now, using exactly the same logic as before, I can write this thing as I can write the alpha daggers, do all the stuff I did before, and I get P1 through Pn. And now these guys all get tilde. I get Q1 through Qm tilde. Okay? Right? But I claim that this is exactly equal to what I had before. What I had before, oh sorry, star. Star, okay? And so let me just unstar it by reversing it. I have P1 tilde through Qm tilde P1 through Pm n without the star, okay? And so what I claim is that this is exactly the same as what I had before. Before, I had the same thing except the tildes were over here. But they're exactly the same thing because this is just a, a, a sum of products of delta functions, delta of this, this, delta of all possible combinations summed over all of the, 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 the permutations here. Uh, and, uh, well, and this is non-zero only if m is equal to n. That's the same in both cases. And the basic point is that for any two q's, this is equal to, let me do the other way around, qp, qp is equal to, uh, let's say qp tilde is equal to q tilde p, right? Right? Because these are equal only if the three momenta are opposite, because I've tilted this guy. The three momenta of P and Q are opposite. And the same thing here, and yeah, that's it. Okay? So what have I proved? What I just proved is that P dagger is equal to P, right? Because I've shown that their matrix elements between general states are the same. But P is P inverse, as I've said before. So this tells me that P is unitary. And therefore, P is a uh, symmetry. Okay? All right? So for a free theory, I have this extra parity symmetry. All right. So now let's do the same kinds of steps for time reversal. Now, it's actually a little bit simpler to think about PT, the product of parity and time reversal, because that's something that just takes the whole four vector to minus, minus itself. Um, since we've defined P, if we know PT, we know T, because we can just undo P. Okay? So we'll talk about PT. 
All right, so if we wanted to uh, just copy the previous discussion, we would say, okay, great. Uh, I will define P the PT operator acting on a field, okay, to just reverse the sign of the uh, of, of, of X, okay? And if I remember, let me just talk about a real field here. Uh, if I remember what this was in terms of the creation and annihilation operators, I have alpha of P e to the minus I P dot X, plus alpha dagger of P e to the plus I P dot X. Uh, you see that if I'm reversing X, I'm exchanging these two exponentials. And so what that is doing is it, uh, it, it needs to be exchanging alpha with alpha dagger, right? In order, that would be the thing that would implement this transformation right here. So PT inverse acting on alpha of P, PT, would be alpha dagger of P, right? It's easy to see. If you plug that in, if you reverse the alphas and the alpha daggers, it would be exactly equivalent to reversing uh, X the four vector x, okay? But this is really totally crap, because if I, uh, ex if I evaluate this now, if I evaluate this definition of pt, so I, I should put a big question mark here, because this is gonna turn out to be totally wrong. Um, if I evaluate this definition of pt between two states, two arbitrary uh, n particle states, right? Well, what, I just do the same kind of thing that I did before, so I have Q1 through Qm, and now uh, this is going to be Pt acting on a bunch of creation operators, uh, alpha dagger P1 through Pn acting on the vacuum, and then I could use this, rewrite this with Pts and Pt inverses to make each one of these be the Pt transforms of these, but those turn all of those uh, alpha daggers get turned into alphas now, P1 through alpha of Pn0, okay? And that's just zero. So this says that the matrix element, for this definition of Pt, the matrix element between arbitrary matrix, its matrix elements are all zero between all possible states. That is certainly not a good definition of Pt, okay? And if you look at this, you stare at this for a long time, it's actually really hard to figure out what went wrong. Because what went wrong is something that's so basic that we just take it for granted. And that is linearity, right? So I've, uh, this is a sum and I've used linearity all over the place here, okay? So it's probably not even clear what that means because how do I talk about an operator that isn't linear? It's very hard to do that because it's so built into our notation and our thinking, okay? So I'm going to have to back up and explain what do I mean by a nonlinear operator. Specifically, what I want is what's called an anti-linear operator. So let me explain that, okay? Okay, so... Uh, uh, we're going to have to change notation a little bit because, like I said, linearity is so built into our no current quantum mechanics notation. So we're used to drawing ket states, okay, and now I'm just going to remove the ket and I'm just going to call the, the state psi, okay? And we're used to writing operators acting on states as products like this. And see, that's what, it is, what makes us sort of assume that they are linear because this is a product, right? So uh, just to, 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 to jar you out of your complacency, I'm just going to call this O psi, and you have to think of this as O acting on psi, not O times psi. This is just the action of O on psi, okay? And then, how do I take, you know, you, I'm used to taking, having bras and kets, right? So I, I'm used to having things like a state chi with a state psi. But now, I'm going to think of this as I've got a state chi and a state psi, and I'm going to put them into a mapping. So there's a mapping, which I will denote to make things as confusing as possible. I'll make this notation look like a bra cat. Um, this is a standard mathematical notation. But here the idea is that, that this thing here uh, accepts two states and gives me back a complex number, right? That's the inner product, all right? Okay? And so in this language, I have an inner product, 
and uh, I, have, I, have, I have operators like this. Let me remind you of something about some properties of this inner product here. This inner product is linear. Let's remember what that means. That means if I take chi, and then I take a linear combination of uh, psi 1 and psi 2, so psi 1 and psi 2 are states, c's are just some complex numbers, right? This is uh, c1 times chi psi 1 plus c2 chi psi 2. Okay. Conversely, if I take linear combinations on the left, if I have c1 chi 1 plus c2 chi 2 with psi, so I'm taking a linear combination on this left hand right here, then this actually becomes c1 star, okay, chi 1 psi uh, plus c2 star uh, chi 2 psi, right? And this stars here are coming because this is really sort of the complex conjugate of this times this summed over the indices or integrated over, you know, the argument or something like that, okay? So this is all just rewriting things that we already know in this uh, more general notation, okay? Okay, now what is unitarity in this relation, in this, in this notation? So if I have, uh, if I have a state uh, if I, let me say I have an operator u, and the, what is the condition that u is unitary? The condition is that if I take the inner product of u acting on chi with u acting on psi, okay, then that is equal to just chi psi. Okay? And the condition is that this holds for every state chi and psi. If that is true, I call this a unitary operator. Okay? And this really is what you know as unitary, because if I write this back in our uh, good old notation, right, that we understood, this is actually, so the, 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 this is actually the ket state with u acting on uh, this, which is actually u dagger acting on this, and this is u acting on this, okay? And so the statement that this is equal to just chi psi for any states here means that u dagger u has to be 1. So this is... In the, this is the, 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 the usual condition that we have for a unitary matrix, okay? All right, but now this, uh, this new notation allows me to define a different kind of operator that's very hard to deal with in the, the standard quantum mechanical notation. And that is an anti-unitary operator. So an anti-unitary operator, let me call it V, Okay, so it is an operator where any state, it acts on the state. So V times Psi is a new state, okay? Um, and the condition for an anti-unitary operator is if I take V chi, V Psi, okay, that that is equal to not chi Psi, which is what I had before, but chi Psi star, okay? So this star is what makes this thing an anti-unitary operator. Okay? And so the, 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 the basic idea here is that why did we even care about unitary operators? Why do we care so much about them? It's because they are transformations that preserve probabilities. They, in fact, preserve uh, the amplitudes. Okay? But if an operator is anti-unitary, it turns basically uh, chi psi into its star. And since it changes every... Uh, 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 overlap into its star, it actually even preserves interference things, it preserves probabilities, it preserves everything. So an anti-unitary operator is just as good of a symmetry transformation as a unitary operator. And in fact, Eugene Wigner proved that any symmetry transformation can be written either as a unitary or an anti-unitary operator, but not both. In practice, time reversal invariance is the only anti-unitary -unit transformation that that exists as far as I know, okay? So anyway, this is the definition of an anti-unitary operator. And it really does take a little getting used to, okay? So for example, let's take, uh, let's take this thing here, uh, the state chi overlapped with V times uh, V acting on a linear combination of uh, psi 1 and psi 2. Okay, let's look at this. Well, now, remember the basic property of, uh, of, of, of anti-unitary operators that I wrote there. Uh, you can think of this relationship as saying that I can multiply by a V inverse on both sides of this and then put in a star, 
right? That's what this thing here says. So if I do that over here, if I put in a V inverse, I get a V inverse chi, and then the V inverse here removes this V, and I get C1 chi1 plus C2 chi2. But because I did these two V inverses, I have to put a star here. That's the anti-unitary uh, part of this, okay? Um, and now, I can just use the ordinary linearity of the, uh, of the, the inner product, but I have this star here, so this actually gives me C1 star times V inverse chi acting on psi 1 plus C2 star uh, V inverse chi acting on psi 2. Star. Can't forget the stars. It's all about the stars here. Okay? And again, using the V inverse on both sides things, this is C1 star chi V psi 1 plus C2 star chi uh, V psi 2, okay, now without the star, okay? And this holds for any chi and psi 1 and psi 2, and so what I see is that actually V acting on C1, psi 1, C2, psi 2, V acting on this is actually not C1 times V acting on this plus V2, C2 times V acting on this, but the stars of the C's, V psi 1 plus C2 star V psi 2, okay? And this is the basic property of anti-linear, this, this property here is called anti-linearity, it's called anti-linearity, because it, it's almost linearity, but it's anti in the sense that there's a complex conjugate that appears in these coefficients. And it's this relation that is kind of weird, right? It says that, you know, you just cannot think of this as a product because the, the C's on this side are return C stars when they come out here, okay? Now, the way to keep track of this uh, without going insane is to think of it in the following way. To think of this operator as an operator that acts on C numbers by complex conjugation because that's what this amounts to. You can think of this V acting on this thing is, uh, is, you know, it acts on the C numbers here as complex conjugation, and then it does whatever it does to the vectors. Okay? All right? Okay, so the claim is going to be that PT is going to be an anti-unitary operator in the sense that I've just described. Okay? So how does it act? <coughs> well, the claim is that what we want is PT inverse alpha of P, PT. We want that to be, drum roll please, alpha of P. And so this looks wrong because it looks like we're not doing anything. It looks like we're just keeping all the operators the same. But it is not so because of anti-linearity. So uh, let's see what this means for the, the field phi of x. Okay, what is this? Well, we have to do the PT inverse thing on this linear combination, this integral, alpha of P, e to the minus P dot X plus alpha dagger of P, e to the plus I P dot X. And then we have our PT again over here. Okay? And <clears throat> what does this PT operation do? Well, it just keeps these guys, doesn't do anything to those guys, right? But it complex conjugates, so it complex conjugates these guys right here. And so it is dp uh, alpha of p e to the plus i p dot x by complex conjugation. Doesn't change this guy, alpha of p e to the minus i p dot x. And that indeed is phi of minus x. It is exactly that. Okay? All right. Now, what we've actually done here is actually pretty cool, okay? Because what we've shown is that uh, PT is, uh, is anti-unitary. It is actually a symmetry, okay? Now, lest we get too excited about this, uh, we've only shown this for a free, uh, a free theory, okay? But amazingly, if we allow arbitrary interactions of this uh, free scalar field theory, then 
we can actually show that no matter what, this theory is actually PT invariant. Okay? And uh, so I want to, uh, so this is skipping way ahead because we haven't actually shown, uh, even discussed interacting theories. But the idea is so simple and so beautiful, I want to just tell you what the idea is for proving the PT theorem. Okay? Now, you may not have ever have heard of the PT theorem. You've probably heard of the CPT theorem. Well, because we have a real scalar C, which is charge conjugation, doesn't do anything. And we'll talk about C on complex scalars in a second. But I want to explain what the idea is behind the PT theorem when we have real fields like this scalar here for interacting theories. Okay? So, uh, okay. so how, 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 is this, how is this proved? It's proved by uh, an amazing, uh, amazing and beautiful idea. We take these, uh, the, the fields and everything that we calculate depends on space-time coordinates. But what we do is we allow these guys, we now allow these uh, coordinates to become complex. It's very often in physics, right, it's useful to take real things and allow them to be complex and see what happens. So it's allowed in this case as well, okay? And it turns out that what you can show is that when you make these things complex, you can really analytically continue your whole theory into this complex uh, domain, okay? And then what you, you also end up with complex Lorentz transformations acting on these things. So now you allow complex Lorentz transformations. Okay, uh, what's the big deal about complex Lorentz transformations? Well, the idea is that you can go, remember we had these two disconnected regions, one was uh, gamma zero zero uh, being bigger than plus one, or we had to have gamma zero being less than or equal to minus one, right? We had these two disconnected regions. But now the claim is that we can go continuously between these guys right here. Before, there wasn't a, there wasn't a continuous way to go between these two things. We had two disconnected mass shells, okay? And to see that we can go continuously between these, I can just give you uh, give you an, an, an example. So I can look at a, a, a matrix, gamma mu nu, that looks like this. Cosine theta, I sine theta, I sine theta, cos theta. So the upper two by two block is kind of like a rotation matrix with some I's in here and the same sign here and here. And then it acts trivially on the other two components. Now because of this I here, this is not a legitimate Lorentz transformation, but it's a complex Lorentz transformation. And I can check that it keeps the metric invariant in the sense that it satisfies my defining condition here that we had for, for Lorentz transformations, that it preserves the metric in this sense. Okay? The metric is real, but this thing is complex, it, it preserves this thing. Okay? And now notice this Lorentz transformation is a function of theta, so there's a continuous parameter. And if theta is zero, this is just the identity. I get cosine, cosine, the off-diagonal things are zero. On the other hand, if I evaluated it pi, right, I get, uh, I get the transformation uh, that looks like, uh, what does it look like? Um, minus one, no. Right, sorry, minus one, minus one, one, one. I panicked for a second, yes, that's what we get, okay? And indeed, you see that the sign of the zero, zero component has gone from plus one to minus one, okay? All right? So now you can ask yourself, oh, oh, okay, can I also go from determinant plus one to determinant minus one? But no, you can't, because the, uh, the determinant is always plus or minus one, even for complex Lorentz transformations. If you take the determinant of both sides of this, you get that, that the determinant is either plus one or minus one, and you just can't jump from plus one to minus one by doing anything continuous. Okay? And so the point is, is that if you remember the different, uh, the different components that we had, if you can flip the sign of the uh, zero, zero component, but you, keep, you, you don't flip the sign of the determinant, that's exactly what PT does. Okay? And so the basic idea of the proof, and of course I'm not going to give the proof, I'm just telling you the idea. The idea is that this invariance under, uh, you, you see, we, we, we must have the invariance under these continuous Lorentz transformations because of analytic, uh, beca basically because of the analytic continuation into complex space forces 
the uh, invariants under these continuously connected to the identity complex Lorentz transformations, and that exactly implies the invariants under PT. Okay? So you can, you can really prove this as a rigorous theorem uh, just assuming some basic analyticity properties of the theory. Okay? Okay. Um, now, one word, I, one thing I have to uh, clarify a little bit here is that when we defined parity and uh, PT, if we defined P and PT, we actually uh, didn't write down the most general possible transformation. Okay? So, <clears throat> when we wrote down P inverse phi of X P, we said that this was phi of, uh, let me write this down as Tx, we wrote this down as T minus X, for example, okay? Now, actually, we could have included a general phase here like this, okay? So omega here is a general complex phase, okay? So the magnitude of omega is 1. Now, the fact that P squared is equal to the identity tells us that omega squared as a complex number is 1, and that tells us that, in fact, omega has to be either plus or minus 1. So really, I could have included a sign here, okay? And this is something which is actually done in particle physics. Uh, the plus sign ones are called scalars, and the ones where omega is minus 1 are called pseudoscalars. So pseudoscalars also flip sign under, uh, under, um, under parity, okay? So you can ask the question, well, okay, well, why couldn't I have done the same thing with PT? All the things that I said here are also true for PT. I could have put in a complex phase. PT squared is 1, so the phase has to be plus or minus 1. So why couldn't I have defined a new thing, and I'll call it PT with a big tilde over it. It's an ugly notation because it's, a, it's not a great idea, as we'll see. But anyway, I defined this thing to be... PT tilde, this thing here, let's suppose I find that to be minus phi of minus x. So why don't I define it with a minus sign like that? And if I define it with a minus sign like that, it is simply not true that every interacting theory is invariant under this PT tilde. Okay? So for example, I can write down an interaction term in my Lagrangian that looks like, say, minus lambda phi cubed, or any other odd power of phi. right? And this is clearly not invariant under this uh, minus sign thing, okay? But this is just because I've written my PT tilde is just PT times an operation which I could call S, where S is just S inverse phi of x, uh, S is just minus phi of x. So I can think of this PT tilde as the combination of what I called PT before and what I called this S here to change the sign. Okay? And the PT theorem tells me that this PT is the thing that is invariant. That's what the PT theorem says. Okay? Um, I bring this up just because there is a lot of dis confusing discussion, sometimes confusing discussion in the literature where people talk about what is the correct definition of parity and so on. Um, uh, why do people sometimes define uh, omega like this? Because sometimes it is the case that in the case of parity, that P times this S, which changes the sign of the field, is a symmetry, but P by itself is not. And in that case, it's better to define parity to be the, symmetry, the one that, in, that is invariant. In other words, sometimes for parity, you can get something that is invariant by choosing the sign correctly. And if you choose the wrong thing, you won't get an, a, a, a symmetry. But PT, we've just proved that PT is always a symmetry, and so there's no sense in defining this PT tilde. Okay? I hope that's clear. All right. Okay, the last thing I want to talk about is charge conjugation. So now let's consider the case where this is a complex field. Phi, phi is now a complex field, a free field, again, okay? And so we can write it, remember now, if we decompose it into our creation and annihilation operators, it looks like uh, there's an e to the minus i p dot x, beta dagger p e to the plus i p dot x, okay? And what we want is we want what charge conjugation is, as the name implies, it is something that interchanges plus and minus charges. 
So what we want is C inverse alpha of P C to be beta. Okay? So uh, under C, instead of annihilating a plus charge, we want to annihilate a negative charge. We're just going to flip positive and negative charges. And so again, C inverse uh, beta this C is alpha. So it interchanges the alphas and betas. Okay? Um, great. So what does that do to the field? You can just see up here. If I now do this to the field, phi of x uh, C, okay, what's that going to do? It's going to interchange the alphas and the betas, keeping everything the same, right? But interchanging the alphas and the betas is the same as changing the sign of this argument. So it's actually exactly the same as complex conjugating the field. Okay? And so, once again, we've defined this thing C, and just as with the case uh, of, of parity, we have to check that this is in fact unitary. Okay? So, to check that it's unitary, we're just going to do the same kind of thing we did before. We're just going to evaluate it on its matrix elements in general states. So, uh, let's remember how we're going to look, talk about the general states. We'll talk about them as uh, a list of momenta which, of guys that have plus charges and the list of momenta of the guys that have negative charges. This is the same abbreviated notation we had before. And this is the product of a bunch of alpha p's, where all of these p are members of this set. And then we have a product of p primes, beta dagger p primes. Right, where each of these p primes is a member of this set, and all of that acts on the vacuum. Okay? And now, the way that we want to define the C operator acting on these states, right, we can easily see, using this definition right here, that the C operator acting on this state, it does the ob obvious thing. It just turns all of these plus charged guys into minus guys and vice versa. So now I have a state with p prime guys that are all plus and p which are all minus. Okay? And so now what I can do, and I will just leave this as an exercise, what I can do is I can just find uh, an arbitrary matrix element of this. I can take q with plus, q prime with minus, calculate c of that, p plus p prime minus, okay? I can calculate that, right, just using this relation. Uh, and then I can calculate the same thing, C dagger. So I calculate C, I calculate C dagger, whoop. I calculate them both, I will see that they are the same thing. Okay, so C equals C dagger equals C inverse. Okay, so indeed it is unitary, okay. And um, if you follow this, uh, if you follow through the, yeah, so this is, this is, unit, this is unitary, okay? All right. And the, the point is now that if I look at what, how PT acts on a complex scalar, let me look at PT, phi of x, uh, PT, right? If I, if I remember that what this thing looks like is alpha e to the minus i p dot x, plus beta dagger e to the i q dot x dp, right? This is what phi of x does. So what pt does is it flips the sine of x, right? But flipping the sine of x is the same as complex conjugation. So this is also phi dagger of x, okay? So for a complex scalar field, I see that actually cpt, okay, acts as the identity, because PT is complex conjugation, and C is complex conjugation. And this is the CPT symmetry for free scalar, complex scalar fields. And the same sort of analytic continuation argument tells me that CPT is a symmetry even for interacting complex scalar fields. And this kind of argument can be generalized to arbitrary spins, and that is the famous CPT theorem. Okay, that's it for now.